Okay, yeah. Uh, today, uh, Ramesh Raghunathan. And um, we are with us today, uh, Praveen. Praveen, yeah. welcome. So, so, Praveen is, um, is a faculty in our machine learning lab. Uh, and among other things, one of his key areas of research is multi agent And that's what we're going to be discussing today. And instantly, it's a matter of pride for many like me that Praveen is also an alumni, uh, alumnus of uh, TripIT, one of the first batch graduates who went on to do research, uh, worked in the US for some time, came back uh, and joined TripIT as uh, faculty. Praveen, welcome. Thank uh, you so much. So, uh, so, Praveen, let's just start with uh, I mean, multi agent system has an English meaning, and of course, it's obviously a computer science. Let's start with just let's define what is multi agent. Uh, so the way I would start is maybe I'll start with what is an agent because the word multi-agent has got an agent. So let me start there and then we'll take to the multi-agent part. So as such, a technical definition of agent would be uh, it's an entity. It can be a hardware entity, software entity, uh, but it's part of a well-defined environment and it has got a goal. So it has got sensors and it uses whatever it senses to achieve its goal. So that's really the very basic definition. So a lot of things can fit into what we call as an agent. So therefore, if you take an example, for example, traffic, right? So in traffic, uh, the uh, driver uh, here is the sensing the environment in order for the driver to achieve, right? The goal can be reaching some particular destination. Uh, so what the driver needs to do is at every point of time, uh, they have to sense the environment, right? Because if you don't sense the environment, then you cannot really drive in a uh, safe fashion. You cannot take decisions, right? So therefore, um, a traffic is a setting where um, each of the vehicle can be considered an agent because the vehicle is part of a well-defined environment which is vehicles around itself. Uh, they have got a goal because they need to reach one particular destination. Without hurting or without hurting anybody. Other. Yeah. Yeah. And that's where the sensing part helps, which is that they can use this whatever they sense to reach the destination in a good fashion, optimizing whatever metric they want. And intelligence so is an inherent part of this. Intelligence is an inherent part. So they're primarily around AI today. Multi-agent systems are AI systems. Yeah, yeah right. multi-agent systems are, uh, when we say multi-agent systems, typically we refer to AI, AI based the only thing is the multi part here refers to the fact that you have multiple such AI systems, mm. right? So uh, when we take, uh, when we call, when, when we generally say AI system, what we are trying to do is we are trying to build a standalone system that is very smart in some sense, right? Mm. For example, if you take a vision system, we want to build a system that is highly accurate in terms of vision performance, right? Or if you take an NLP based system, we want to build a software or a system that can do very well NLP based tests. Right? But uh, what we are talking about in a multi-agent system is we have got N such entities, right? AI systems. So which are independent and also together perform something. Together perform something, ah. right? So therefore, uh, each of these entities need not be very smart actually, right? They can be uh, um, like uh, they have some capabilities, but the culmination of their capabilities can lead to something bigger, right? Uh, so for example, uh, if uh, robo soccer now, uh, now that, that's a competition that happens in multi-agent field. So each uh, robot by itself has got certain skills, but then the combination of the skills becomes a, a team that can perform wonderfully well. Hmm. Or yeah, or traffic is another example. Using all the cameras and other sensors yes. uh, to correctly manage uh, the traffic. Yeah. There is this uh, uh, robotics. Madhav has this um, uh, one of his robots. Uh, I think it's a stair climbing robot, mm -hmm. which separates, the links separate out, mm -hmm. the links can independently move, mm -hmm. and then they can come together and then move as a, like a centipede. Okay. Now, so this is like, say, if the robot is navigating in some terrain where they can't go as a, as a full vehicle. Yeah. Uh, they can separate out, each can move past the, maybe a narrow opening. Yes. And then they can come together. Yes. And the links are dispensable. Yes. Uh, so would that be an example of uh, multi-agent system? Yeah, the, because the links can move independently. Yes, and they also know that they can come together and then form a centipede-like chain. Yeah, uh, they together they do something else. Independently they do something else, but even independently they're aware of each other. Mm -hmm. So would that be an example of multi-agent system? 
uh, yeah it can certainly fall into the real or into the definition of multi agent system provided those indi individual modules they are fairly smart at least they have, to have some uh, uh, they also have their own yes, yeah they also yes. have their own functionality or something hmm. which they can accomplish but then together they are accomplishing a bigger thing right because together they are accomplishing the uh, uh, navigating the different terrains and so on but individually probably they still have some functionality or this other example that's there in the data sciences lab mm -hmm. uh, which i believe uh, kamal's working on mm -hmm. uh, where a set of drones can lift something yes uh, and then like uh, they can compensate for each other mm -hmm. any drone can get off of it mm -hmm. and another drone can come mm -hmm. and uh, latch on to what they're lifting and uh, so that's also a, a, a case of uh, multi agent system right yeah that would be a great example of multi agent system because let's say a table mm -hmm. right now one person by ourselves may not be able to lift the table but when two people come together we are able to lift the table and keep it uh, somewhere mm -hmm. right so which means that f by coordinating with each other we are able to do something bigger than what individually we are able to accomplish i mm -hmm. think so something similar is what these drones are supposed to be doing yes, which they're is together lifting something uh, yeah. and each is independent yes. but they know what others are doing mm -hmm. and, uh, and and together work on uh, on the task. Yeah. Uh, okay. Uh, what are the other more common examples? I mean, uh, of multi. Before we get into a little bit more into how multi agent systems work. Yeah. Uh, what are the other examples today? I mean, if you have to pick up some examples today. Yeah. So I would say um, uh, traffic is a great example because uh, no matter whatever, uh, I mean, uh, no matter whatever is the issue there, most of it is dependent on other others that are around you hmm. right no vehicle can pretty much act independently uh, they, they are always uh, whatever decision they make it is a function of all the other things that are around around us now a similar way i would say uh, as more as iot picks up internet of uh, things uh, these uh, each individual machine or each individual uh, component they can collect some data they can do some basic processing but as a group they can actually give a better picture of the of the area they are working with mm. right so for example in building let's say we have got n such uh, intelligent devices mm. each one is collecting something maybe what is the light intensity one is collecting what is the fan speed one is collecting what is the power usage and so on mm. but together they can give a better picture of the building that will allow us to uh, take some intelligent decision saying that oh okay now there are less people in the building probably mm. we can uh, <coughs> maybe reduce uh, some of the devices that are being switched on or off and so on so in in just in that example uh, are they collectively taking the decision or would there also be cases where there is some kind of a mothership somewhere uh, that make some of the aggregate decisions uh, what's the typical architecture yeah so that's a very interesting question so if if all these devices are just uh, sending all their uh, data to some centralized place and the centralized place is doing the um, decision making, then probably we still don't call it multi. It's not, a, system. It's not truly a multi. Truly a multi. Huh. So in a multi agent system, what uh, we expect is based on the inputs that we have got from others, I should still be able to take some decisions myself. Hmm. Right. Uh, the only thing is, uh, if there is enough correlation in those decisions, huh. then we would all be doing uh, good amount of. I mean, uh, at least in this particular example, if uh, somehow there is correlation among our decisions, then huh. we will be able to take. We will be able to come up with a good global uh, solution. That is, if we all say that, we agree that, look, there are less number of people in the building, hmm. so we should switch off some functionalities. Now that can be. Uh, uh, now that is a coordination that happened between these and they are able to take a decision without someone instructing them to do something. So is that a necessary meaning, uh, is it always necessary that in multi agent systems there is no central entity even if the nodes are independently intelligent? Yeah. Is it necessary that they only make collective decision or is it okay in architectures where they also have a, like a, a super node type entity that is processing across all of these nodes? So you can have some hierarchical structures where some level of decision making happens at low level. These low level decisions pass, get passed on to one higher level one. Again, they can make some level of decision making and then pass on to top layer, hmm. which does different layer of decision making. So for example, the top level, at the top level, it can be a strategic decision making, a high level decision making. Uh, at the middle level, there can be a little low level decision making. And at the lowest level can be a very, uh, at the basic kind of uh, decision making. So hmm. The architectures do allow for it, hmm. uh, 
but the key point here is uh, there is some level of autonomy that each of them has right if it is totally just i collect data pass it on to someone someone is doing the decision making probably we may not call it a multi agent system so more, what are the most common deployments today uh, in the ai space where multi agent systems are deployed i mean yeah. deployed i mean understand a lot of possibilities and yes. uh, research is looking at many other Yeah. but uh, actually deployed uh, are there any good examples yeah so i would start with my own research uh, so my phd work was in the area of um, uh, again multi agent systems with the game theory kind of uh, mathematical background mm-hmm. uh, so i developed a security system for airport mm-hmm. uh, so this uh, system uh, is uh, used for um, deciding the patrolling routes of police in airport Hmm. that's what that uh, system is meant for so how does how do police uh, patrol around the airport in a smart fashion what is the smart patrolling strategies you can come up with the thing is uh, you cannot arbitrarily increase the number of police in an airport hmm. right so what you do is uh, uh, you can only use your resources in a smarter fashion hmm. so the smartness that we bought into that system is that uh, police operations in general should be randomized to some extent hmm. and uh, that's uh, that randomization we had a mathematical way to compute it we are able to model the environment we are able to model what are who are the other players in this environment hmm. and then um, we were able to decide what is that uh, kind of what is that optimal patrolling a police should be doing while performing the pet- patrolling and this software uh, we handed it over to los angeles airport hmm. and they have been using it for the past uh, 10 years now so each vehicle makes independent decision but aware of what other vehicles are doing patrol uh, vehicles uh, yeah so um, in uh, so in the specific uh, in the specific software uh, they what they do is uh, they uh, the lax airport authorities they want to place checkpoints in the airport right hmm. so they place checkpoints at different places and uh, once they place checkpoints they are going to see which vehicles should they check or which vehicles they can just leave and so on hmm. the only thing is they don't want these checkpoints every day to be happening at the same place they they have certain different hmm. uh, points hmm. and they want to randomize among these points uh, so that um, Uh, so that say monday 9 to 11 am if uh, in week 1 i had got a checkpoint at this particular gate maybe the next week it's not at the same gate hmm. so that way someone who has a good idea of this airport still wouldn't be able to predict which checkpoints will be free or not hmm. right because they are not going to place checkpoints at every point in the airport they have certain spots where they can place these checkpoints hmm. uh, the only thing is they want to randomize these operations hmm. uh, so that uh, someone who is observing this airport for a long enough time still wouldn't be able to understand stand today where the checkpoint would be hmm. right so that's one uh, that's one uh, application there the other thing is uh, at least the same software the, it is also used for uh, canine routes canine, hmm. canine is the dogs hmm. they should patrol around the airport hmm. so what routes should they should go around the airport hmm. right because they also cannot uh, lx is a huge airport they cannot go every single point and canine dogs are not easily trainable right hmm. so it's only um, four uh, i mean they have only uh, they can only have a couple of dogs hmm. right so therefore they cannot cover every point so therefore what they would want to do is uh, one particular day they want certain routes to be covered so, what are the agents in these examples both the examples yeah in both the examples uh, the police team is how, how we modeled as agent the team is agent the yeah. team the police team versus the opponent team that's yeah. how we modeled it but the opponent uh, there is nothing called a opponent team there this right opponents are all independent opponents hmm. but they can be different types here hmm. right so when i say types there can be opponents that are interested uh, just to smuggle goods into airport hmm. uh, there can be opponents that are interested to cause harm to human life hmm. there can be opponents that are actually smuggling doing human trafficking hmm. and there can be opponents that are just uh, stealing things from airport hmm. basic any, kind of any thing. of these unwanted things that Yes. the uh, patrolling need to detect yes so therefore they have to model these types uh, but all these types uh, have to be uh, uh, i mean the our strategy should be formulated in such a way that we have to maximize the catching of all these uh, different types hmm. so it goes beyond i mean there's a lot of other factors that come in as well it's yes. not just this indi- independent agents yes there's all these other factors in terms of where all the vulnerable spots in the airport or all yeah. the other things when come into play yes the other factors are traffic that's very hard to because we have to have some level of prediction of traffic hmm. uh, because based on historical data we do it that okay these areas will be heavily crowded these areas will be low crowded and that crowd also will be function of time probably maybe there are certain times in the day where some parts of the so airport so it's a much more it's much more complex system. it's a very sophisticated 
the agents, but there's a lot of other external factors that need to be. Uh, yeah, we, we call it still the environment of the agent. Environment right? of the we agent. still model it as the environment. That's why when I told the definition of agent, it has to be a well defined so environment. So, it will function in an environment. So, yeah. in this case, all these other data, yeah. traffic, and all the other things is the environment. Part of the environment. Okay. Yeah. What are the other, are there other examples? Yeah, so any I of. Mean deployed, not in research, deployed. Um, when we say deployed, uh, for example, meeting scheduling uh, kind of softwares, hmm. um, I can't I'm, I'm, I can't particularly say they are deployed only using multi-agent technology. They are general distributed. So one of our starters, yeah. just which is specifically in this meeting space. Yeah. Um, so they they help schedule meetings. Yeah. So there's a bot. Yeah. Now, though it's not designed as a multi-agent system, but it can function, I presume. Like uh, so, if I'm using the bot, mm -hmm. the bot acts on my behalf. Hmm. If I'm saying, okay, Praveen, let's meet, or three of us, let's meet next week. Mm -hmm. Now, often it goes through a very complex like email back and forth before we can agree upon a time that works. Because yeah. we're in different organization, we don't have access to the calendars. Yeah. Now what this bot does, once I start the mail thread, I will tell, look, I'm going to let this uh, Alexa uh, fix the meeting. Mm -hmm. And it's a bot. Yeah. So if you come back saying, I suggest you let's meet Monday. If you come back saying, no, Monday I'm traveling, can we meet Tuesday? Yeah. The bot knows it. Yes. And then says, okay, like if it's okay, the third person, let's do Tuesday. The third person might come back saying, Tuesday is fine, but let's do it at three o'clock. Mm -hmm. And I'm out of the picture now. Mm -hmm. Now, but if my bot were talking to your bot yes. and the other bot, if the three bots are helping schedule a meeting for us, would yeah. that be a multi-agent system? Uh, that would be a multi-agent system provided the bots are not giving away all the information, right? It's not like they're reading of my calendar and just giving no, away the information. No, they're only re reading mails here okay. because they don't have access to each other's calendar. That's the whole... Okay. But it has, it has access to my calendar. My yes. bot has access to my calendar. Huh, that, that's what I'm saying. Yeah. So as long as it has access to my call, calendar, but it is not totally giving away saying, look, this is my calendar of my user. Now you give yeah. your calendar, I give your calendar. Then it is optimization problem. Huh. No, it's not right? that. In huh. this case, it, yes. it calendar is privacy. So you can't yes. share the calendar. That is the exact. So it's negotiating through email only. Yeah. And uh, just that my bot has access to my calendar. Yeah. So that's a... Is that, that example? It, that so would be, that scheduling is a multi-agent yes, uh, system. Yes, definitely. We actually have a model called DCOPS uh -huh. that particularly look at this kind of modeling. Right? It's called distributed constraint optimization. Hmm. So each uh, agent has got some some constraints and in spite of all those constraints, they should come up with a global policy. The hmm. global policy here is a meeting, hmm. right? Because you have to schedule a meeting that involves all, all the people. Three, yes. But yet each of us have got uh, personal constraints, uh -huh. right? My user will is not available in the morning. Hmm. <coughs> some slots hmm. the other user may not be available in the evening in some slots and so on right hmm. all these constraints we have to account for when we come up with a meeting schedule so that everyone is happy in the situation hmm. yeah now uh, just just one more thing around example before we move in mm -hmm. um, so the drone swarms yes right yeah, there are a lot of uh, swarm uh, applications kind of it's still not it's still a very at some level seeming like fiction it is there in movies and such yes uh, we have seen in some recent movies as well yeah um, but uh, but I'm sure they are uh, realistic. It's going to happen soon uh, yes. because drones are pretty much mainstream now and swarm of drones. Uh, can you give some examples of drone swarms that are functioning in a multi-agent uh, system format? Yeah, so I would say uh, area coverage. Uh, mainly, for example, there is a big area and uh, we want um, uh, different parts of the areas to be covered. Uh, but at the same time, uh, these drones uh, still have to chat with each other for uh, for exchanging information and so on. Mm. Now that can be, uh, so for example, search operations. Now uh, a missing whatever, so something is missing in a forest. Mm. Now we want the operations to be uh, performed in an automated manner. Now in this case, uh, drones also have to communicate with each other saying that, look, I have covered this area, you have covered this area. Uh, but at the same time, they are uh, able to do their operations. So the constraint is to cover the whole area. Yes. And between them, they have to negotiate, yes. identify who's where, who's doing what. Y yes. But collectively, cover Col the whole area. Yes. While each of them has their own uh, parts. Parts. And on top of it, uh, it can happen that some drones will have some specialized sensors. Some drones uh, need not have specialized sensors. In which case, more dependencies will come into picture. Hmm. Because uh, let's say there is an area one drone is covering, but it's not very clear. Somehow the picture is not coming out clear because of the colors or something. Hmm. It has to ask the help of the specialized drone and asking it to come and help it out for this particular uh, area or for this particular snapshot and so on. Hmm. So there are, uh, once you start making these agents heterogeneous in nature, you are going to see that there is a lot of dependencies that come into the picture that hmm. would make it a truly multi-agent system. Hmm. Right? Uh, yeah. So now, just dwelling a little deeper, yes. what are the key architectural constructs in a multi-agent system? Um, 
Yeah, so probably I would say, um, see, uh, multi, when we say multi-agent systems, all we are saying is the agents should have uh, some level of dependencies on each other, hmm. right? But these dependencies me can mean that they they are de they are dependent because they want to coordinate with each other, hmm. or they are dependent because they want to compete with each other. Hmm. Now both things can happen. For example, in the security domain, I explained earlier, the the, the entities are all competing. The hmm. police team and the opponents they are not co cooperating. Hmm. But at the same time, I need to model the other party. Without modeling the other party, I cannot formulate my own policy, hmm. right? Because my own strategy is completely dependent on the others, uh, what others are doing. Hmm. But then we are totally, we, we are not at all cooperating with each other, right? Hmm. It is a competition scenario um, where I have to model others and still come up with my own strategy. Hmm. So typically, that kind of um, the problems are modeled using game theory, hmm. right? So game theoretic formulations are used for modeling this sort of competitive scenarios, hmm. whereas there are cooperative to scenarios like the robo soccer I mentioned in earlier. That's mm. a good domain where the team has to work, to, each agent has to work with the team and uh, as a team they have to win the game, mm. right? Because uh, uh, what is happening is uh, the reward function, what we call as a reward function is the team, uh, the number of goals scored by the team. It's mm. not number of goals scored by me, it's not number of uh, shots that I take, but my reward function is defined as the number of goals scored by the team, mm. right? Uh, or uh, number of goals scored my, by my team versus number of goals scored by the other team. That's mm. the reward function. So because of the way we structured this reward function, what is happening is we will naturally behave as a team because uh, by my, myself doing most of the shots, nothing is going to happen. Yes. Because uh, the goal here is uh, we all have to cooperate and then lead to uh, mm. that uh, maximum number of goals or whatever, right? So therefore, architecturally, when we look at a high level, architecturally, multi-agent systems, mm. um, they are uh, either cooperating or competitive scenarios, mm. right? And cooperative uh, settings, uh, we have uh, models. Uh, we have some models like uh, decentralized MDPs, decentralized POMDPs and other things. Mm. And uh, whereas competitive settings, game theory, game theoretic formulations are pretty popular. Mm. Right. So in that sense, yes, uh, there are. So there are more models than architectural elements. I mean, they're not necessarily architectural elements, but there are more models to be followed. Uh, yeah. uh, the architectural models rather than elements. There are no layers as such, unlike a typical software architecture. Okay. Less about layers and more about the models. Yes, more about the models. Yes, that's true. Okay. That's true. And um, so what, what typically goes into building a multi-agent system? Yeah. It's easy to understand in terms of frameworks and such. You use this framework, you build this, you build this. Yeah, yeah. But we talk about models. What's the typical process of building a multi-agent system? Are there any standard practices or is it more uh, theory that you have to apply in your own way? Yeah, so I would say there are still th reasonable thumb rules that we need to follow here. Mm. Uh, the first thing is we have, to, uh, we have to be able to specify what is the agent here. Mm. Right, and why we call it an agent. We cannot just uh, say any entity there is an agent. Mm. Right, so we have to be very clear cut on uh, defining what the agent is and why we call it the agent. Mm. That means it has to have some characteristics. It is able to, as I mentioned, it has to be able to do some sensing, mm. uh, some sensing uh, in between, huh. and it is it ha it should have a goal. It should be able to sense, mm. and it should use whatever it has sensed to uh, achieve its goal. some purpose. Huh. Yeah. Huh. So that that elements we need to cover. When we yeah. say this is an agent in this particular domain, I need to be able to define that at least these elements are there, right? Mm. If these elements are not there, probably I shouldn't be calling it an agent. Mm. Yes, the word agent is in a way a little bit uh, overused, mm. uh, but at least as someone From a, a multi-agent system, VA standpoint, yeah, at least. Huh. We have to define it in this fashion, mm. right? So there should be a clear-cut reason why we call it an agent. Mm. <coughs> That's the first thing. That is, we have to define what are the agents. Mm. The next thing we would uh, want to define is um, what is the nature of interaction between the agents. Hmm. So for example, let's say I'm in a crowd of people. Now I'm in a crowd of people and I'm trying to do some task. Hmm. Now many times that crowd of people I'm not really designing each individual. Hmm. I only view it as a crowd, but I don't really care that e one individual is buying something in a shop, another individual is uh, uh, trying to look something in the cell phone, another mm. at that level I don't actually care about modeling the other people mm. in the crowd. Mm. Right? That's because it doesn't matter to my decision making. Mm. Now in that case, I don't actually call it a multi-agent system because the other agents actually don't matter to my decision making. Right? We are still interacting in some way because physically we are located in some proximity, mm. but really that's not a multi-agent system. Mm. So there, to call it a multi-agent system, the interaction level also should be little more than uh, that, which mm. is that their decisions affect me in some sense. 
Okay. Right. Huh. And I should be able to specify to some extent how the data. So it's not just their data; it's yes. their decisions more than the data. Yeah, they use the data as well. Huh. But the their actions, their, their actions, actions or decisions, in some form affect my actions. My actions. Okay. Right. That is when I call the actually have an interaction with the other party. Otherwise, it's not actually called an interaction. No data exchange. Uh -huh. It's just we are there. Hmm. <laughs> right. Physically, we are there, but really, I don't care about modeling the other party there. Hmm. Right. So that uh, we have to identify. who are the other players in this uh, environment who hmm. are affecting me in some way right huh. so that is something we have to identify when we are designing the multi agent system and then we also have to model uh, are there other factors which i may not be uh, pointing to a particular player maybe it's a weather factor it can be anything the environment huh. uh, how does that affect my decision making so that becomes the context of the solution yes, what are the becomes. context there some external yeah uh, factors or elements or data that's coming in yes so that's to be modeled okay yeah so overall uh, i would say there are two models uh, two high level models one is the quantitative models qualitative models mm. even in decision uh, even in multi agent modeling we have got the qualitative modeling and quantitative modeling mm. for example bda architectures they are very mm. known for qualitative modeling mm. right belief desire intention architecture they, <coughs> Sorry. Yeah. Uh -huh. So in 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 such an architecture, I don't actually give any numbers, right? Mm -hmm. I don't say my, uh, my by taking this action I'm going to get ten units of reward. By taking this action I'm going to get twenty units of reward or so on. But we specify things at a higher level that there is a goal and uh, taking an action is going towards the goal or not mm -hmm. going towards the goal. At that level we are going to model mm -hmm. logic based systems, BDA mm -hmm. architectures. Mm -hmm. Whereas um, the more game theoretic models and uh, Markov decision process, some of these models are called quantitative models. Mm -hmm. here what happens is every single action i take uh, we have to uh, put up a number to it hmm. right so once we put up this numbering what happens is our decision making gets easier hmm. right because then i have to pick that choice i have to beat, pick that sequence of numbers that is going to lead to the best global uh, utility in some sense hmm. right so uh, uh, yeah so when we are modeling uh, a multi agent system depending on whether we are picking the qualitative modeling or the quantitative modeling hmm. um, we are going to think do things uh, differently right in qualitative models we don't necessarily need to supply numbers hmm. uh, whereas in a quantitative model i have to supply numbers to everything right whatever hmm. action i take i have to tell what is the quality of that action in terms hmm. of some numbers right so uh, these are the things that are going to go in as we are trying to model this multi agent system so many terms you use now when describing this are all game theory terms so is game theory very central to multi agent systems like modeling the opponent the uh, qualitative quantitative model in terms of what's the outcome yeah so is game theory very central to multi agent systems G as i told uh, the cooperative scenarios versus competitive scenarios generally competitive scenarios the it, game theory is the Classic defect game theory. Uh, uh. Game, game theory is a very good mathematical model to uh, model such uh, hmm. Uh, yeah, to encode such scenarios. Hmm. But in the teamwork kind of settings, we have got different models. So it's more For, collaborative, so you don't need to uh, beat anybody. Yeah, uh, we don't need to beat anybody. Uh, but uh, there, we still have these uh, decentralized MDPs, Markov decision processes. Hmm. Uh, they are also formal models. Uh, we have state space. We have got actions and so on. The only thing is there, the way we define some of these uh, states, we model it as what we call joint states. Hmm. Joint states means together, what is the current state? Hmm. When I take an action. together what is going to happen to this team hmm. right what is a new state as a team i am going to reach hmm. right so therefore uh, i uh, game theory is a important tool as far as multi agent field is concerned but there are uh, not necessarily the only one uh, not the only one yes. okay and um, typically i mean uh, so they are quite likely to be each one is going to be its own small kind of a mini ai solution and then together they are doing something so probably any ai platform is usable at some level but are there some popular tools or frameworks that are used uh, for multi agent systems yeah jade is a popular uh, software uh, hmm. platform that's used to develop multi agent systems hmm. but uh, as such i think um, uh, as long as things are naturally distributed and they are able to uh, able to have a communication platform between them hmm. uh, they would just form a natural multi agent framework uh, so what exactly does jade do jade is a platform for multi agent uh, modeling so mm. therefore instead of us writing at a thread level and trying to give all the low level details mm. it is going to naturally form this uh, it, it will allow you to program it uh, in a much easier fashion it mm. has got some of the basic things that are handled mm. and it has got a communication model that is available uh, so therefore uh, a user doesn't need to start from scratch so it's a modeling and also runtime i mean you model and also you run using jade or uh, or it's only modeling and 
Okay, when we say, dip, uh, you mean when we say run yeah, deployment. Yes. Uh, I am not particularly sure of the software aspect okay, of okay. the... But yeah. it's more a modeling framework for uh -huh. sure. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Definitely it allows you to model the multi-agent uh -huh. system. So, you often hear uh, smart grids. In yes. The, in the context of one of the, I mean, multi-agent systems, smart grids often get taken. Yes. So... So what is, uh, I mean, obviously smart grids is a subset, superset of multi-agent systems in some yes. form, subset and some form. Yes. So what's the compare and contrast smart grids with multi-agent systems? Yeah, so smart grid, so for example, let's start with what is happening in India currently, right? As a user of electricity, huh. I don't really have many choices, right? So there is electricity, uh, someone who is a player in the market who is providing electricity hmm. and I just subscribe to that user, hmm. uh, to that uh, provider, provider. Huh. to that provider and uh, that's it. Whatever huh. tariff they set, whatever they do, there is no questions that are being asked hmm. here. Right. So we just use the electricity based on our usage, based on the different slabs. Mm. So we are going to get the bill and it ends there. So what the people are trying to move towards is uh, it, it should be viewed more like a trading market, just mm. like a stock market where uh, depending on the price, I'm able to buy a particular stock. We want to view um, electricity also as a market mm. where I see a better tariff being provided by some player. I just want to switch to that player. Hmm. Right. So, in that sense, a smart grid is this plat uh, is this particular is this uh, setup where all these entities that are interacting with each other. That is both the I mean uh, uh, that is the generator of electricity. That is Genco's the ones that produce electricity, hmm. uh, the ones that are users of electricity. That is the consumers, hmm. and then there are brokers hmm. who act as mediators between the uh, producers and the consumers. Hmm. Right. So, there are all these different players and they are all part of this one market, hmm. right? this one market system and then what happens is we let the market evolve. So, it is almost like any other market but a power market uh, in current uh, times uh, is not really like a market. Right? It is just that there is a provider, we just uh, subscribe and we are done. Right? Hmm. This area belongs to this provider and they are the only ones who is going to provide. But now with all the, uh, the net metering coming, rooftop yes. solar, so yeah. now we have the grid is a complex grid now. It is a much more complex grid. Like, yes. I mean, like my house, I have a net meter. Yes. So I'm a three kilowatt, three kilowatt power producer. Yes. And I can choose to give it to the grid anytime I want by yeah. not consuming it. Yes. Uh, but today, there's no, like you said, there's no smartness. Yeah. We, we so just consume, we don't even think about it. Yes. But there could possibly be models where I say, okay, this time I won't consume because I'm going to get a better rate if I give it to the grid. Absolutely. And Absolutely. That's what smart grid is about. So first, first thing uh, to add to your point, which is that uh, the consumers themselves can be producers in the smart grid mm. right because they can actually have a solar panel and they can be consuming uh, at some points of time but then when the solar panels are able to generate more electricity I might become a net producer of electricity mm. so I can the same person can be a consumer as well as a producer right that can be part of the smart grid because now I will be able to sell my excess electricity and you can decide when to do it and I can Based decide when conditions you yes. can adjust your loads accordingly yes uh, use it when there is cheaper power and yes. not use it when there is expensive power yes so therefore a lot of uh, forecasting kind of problems come into picture. Again, machine learning starts coming into picture mm. because uh, all of this will need us to be able to forecast the demands, forecast my productions and so on. Mm. So, smart grid is this uh, complex, therefore it is a complex system where all these uh, players who have got certain incentives, who have got certain motivations, they are all in this market mm. and they can dynamically take decisions. Mm. Right? So, as a consumer, I can say, okay, uh, this broker is not giving me good tariff or this broker is giving me good tariff on Mondays and Tuesdays but then Thursdays and Fridays because my demand is uh, different mm. or my usage is different uh, there is this other broker who is able to do things differently and therefore I will take uh, uh, these two days with one particular broker I would have a agreement with another broker for those other days and so on. Mm. So all these things uh, start getting allowed in a smart grid mm. right whereas which is just not even feasible or we cannot even think of in the So country. are there other I mean smart grid I mean power grids are very common examples we think yes. of power when we think of smart grids. Yes. Are there other examples of smart grids that is not in power? Um, so, when we say smart grid, generally it is, um, I mean as such it is referring to... Some producer-consumer uh -huh. network. Yeah. Uh -huh. Yeah. So, any uh, any of the trading markets we talk about. That right? Whether it's an example of smart grids. Uh, that would be, in a way, they are all uh, in a similar fashion. There is someone who is giving something, there is another person who is uh, taking, buying something hmm. and there are some intermediate is possibly and so on. So, mm. therefore, any market-based system mm. where there are all these players that are interacting, 
uh, they are in lines of this. I mean, now with algorithmic trading, a lot of places it yes. is a machine that is trading. Yes. Uh, maybe it's a model, mathematical model based machine, but they could very soon become a, uh, a more learning uh, learning model based uh, machine. I'm pretty sure uh, algorithmic it's trading. Already you know, yeah, it's already happening properly. It's already happening. The smartness already there. Yeah, yeah, it's just that we don't know it because they are never published. Yes. Right? Because it's one of those secrets which nobody wants to publish probably. <laughs> so there's this uh, thing happening, Vishal's lab, Building huh. Sciences lab. Yes. You're probably aware. Yeah. So where there's this small unit that sits on each desk. Yeah. It's for an office. Mm -hmm. And uh, so there are micro sensors across. Mm -hmm. And this unit uh, can help you decide. And uh, there's game theory applied there. Mm -hmm. Very similar to micro grids. Mm -hmm. uh, so where like each person is given a certain units of power they can consume mm -hmm. and depending on when how many laptops or machines are considered i mean uh, uh, connected right now mm -hmm. it adjusts the cost of a unit okay and if sub the lot so it can say today right now if you need to use you're going to pay double the tariff okay your double the units will get consumed per uh, whatever uh, yes. hour or so yeah you can choose to shut off Yes. And you can give your units to somebody else. You're going to, instead of you paying double, you're going to get double. Yes. Because you're trading with one other, per other person in the same office. Yeah. And you get double, you get extra, you can use it later if you want. Yeah. Uh, so that's an example of smart grid, I presume. Right? Absolutely. It is, so, though it is a micro unit, it's not, yeah. but the purpose is they're all connected. They all know who is there, yeah. which is occupied, which is not occupied. Yeah. And then I can trade with one person. Yes. One person has some urgent work yeah. and like uh, the person has to, and the system has said that right now the unit tariff is twice. Mm -hmm. And the person says, I need to work, so who can give me a tariff, a yeah. unit? Yeah. And somebody can say, okay, I can give you a new unit. Yeah. Yeah. And then like, uh, so that's an example of a... Yeah. So uh, in fact, we are working on an agent called Vidyut Vanika and uh, it has got three markets. One mm. is called the wholesale market, one is called the tariff, uh, the retail market and one is called the balancing market. Uh -huh. And this feature would fall into what we call the balancing market, which is that at this point of time, I uh -huh. have a shortage of electricity or I have excess of electricity uh -huh. and I want to either buy or sell electricity, just that I did not pre-plan it, mm. right? Because I pre plan for X units, but somehow my usage is X plus N units. So these N units, I want to buy it on the fly. Hmm. right in the real time hmm. so that market at least what uh, for the broker that we are developing hmm. uh, so that, that's called a balancing market which is that any shortfall or excess I have to get it out immediately because uh, power is one of those uh, unique commodities unlike a vegetable market or any of the retail markets hmm. in the sense that storage of power is very hard hmm. so that is the key difference uh, that happens between power markets and every other market hmm. right it's just simply not uh, j like vegetables if something is excess probably at least I know that one two more days I can store those vegetables with power markets the battery technology is just uh, yes. very inefficient so you have to find some user right you now have, who needs it yeah yes. so which is real time i have to find the user get rid of the excess power otherwise i just lose that entire thing hmm. right because i don't have a way to save it to hmm. a good extent so that's what makes it very unique problem hmm. and that's what makes it a very challenging problem on how to design this smart grid hmm. as opposed to some of these general Others. markets uh -huh. yeah because there is some latency that is available in the other markets as opposed to the power markets hmm. So before we take uh, the questions from uh, uh, the participant audience, yes. uh, one last thing, if somebody has to build a multi-agent system yes. solution, yeah. what are the underlying uh, either technologies or, uh, or areas that they need to be conversant with yeah. before they can build a multi-agent system? So what are all the subjects or areas that they need to be very conversant? Yeah. Uh, before they can build a multi-agent system. Yeah. So there are uh, some formal models uh, that are uh, well used in multi-agents. So for example, our top conference is called AMAS, Aut Autonomous Agents and Multi-Agent Systems. Uh, so therefore, there are uh, some, uh, a particular set of mathematical uh, techniques that are very popular mm. in this area. Mm. So game theory is certainly one technology that, uh, that so is popular. So they have to popular. be very conversant with game theory. I mean, uh, they it's can good, choose. Good area to have. Huh, I mean, good area a, to know if you're going to build. Huh. Yeah, so there are a uh, couple of areas. Hmm. Out of that, game theory is one tool. Hmm. Right now, whether someone wants to get into game theory or, on, or not, uh, th that uh, individually they can decide. Without hmm. doing game theory, also you can you still can be huh. part of multi agents field and you can still do a lot of things. Right. Hmm. So game theory is just uh, is one particular tool. Mm. Uh, similar way uh, people do BDA architectures quite a bit, mm. right? where we don't get into quantitative models but more qualitative modeling. Mm. Uh, but multi-agent simulations is a big application area mm. and uh, people do use this uh, belief, desire, intention technologies. Mm. Uh, similar way decision theoretic modeling, that's mm. another uh, kind of uh, mathematical modeling mm. uh, people use and uh, again that is also a popular uh, thing. Uh, 
a popular uh, um, mathematical model as far as the field is concerned. Mm. So there are a couple of mathematical models, mm. um, which uh, out of which uh, it need not be that a user needs to be familiar with everything, but a couple of things certainly would help. Uh, logic based systems, for example, they, they were also quite popular, probably mm. in recent times, maybe a little lower, but certainly, again, people who work in logic based systems probably work Il, uh, I mean, most of the time spent on logic based systems, mm -hmm. right? So there are multiple mathematical models or um, for or or uh, formulations that are available in the literature, mm -hmm. and the idea is uh, someone who wants to work in this area can mm -hmm. pick up some of these. Mm -hmm. And uh, what is happening now off late is every one of these models is getting uh, tagged along with some amount of machine learning mm. right so because uh, many of uh, one of the things with the formal modeling is uh, you have to have a lot of data to build that model itself mm. right but many times we may not have sufficient data right which means that there are data gaps mm. so therefore we want to tag machine learning on top of it so that what happens is as more data comes in the model gets automatically filled up mm. right which means the model gets learnt um, instead of assuming that there is a well defined predefined model that is available for me to solve and just solve the problem we assume that yeah this is the mathematical model i want to follow but probably data is still not there yet or sufficient yet mm. so there is also a machine learning layer that is coming on top and over time as more data comes in my mathematical model becomes uh, filled in, filled mm. with all the details mm. which means that at some point it will eventually reach its full potential mm. but i can start off with something uh, so that the system is working the system can do things mm. and keeps on improving itself mm. right so in that sense uh, i would uh, summarize at least the current in the current uh, times mm. uh, there are a couple of frameworks out there uh, along with those frameworks some amount of machine learning is being tagged along so that these uh, models are become robust over time hmm. right instead of assuming there is this model completely available and i just want to solve this model get things done i assume that uh, there is a model that is available it is working to some to a decent extent hmm. but it can improve itself over time because of all this uh, data that can come in and so uh, so what you're saying is like to build an intelligent multi agent system yes you don't need machine learning it's only uh, it's not necessary uh, it is not necessary in the same sense that um, machine learning is a uh, very data driven model. Mm. Um, uh, someone can say my model is already there even without uh, someone else providing all the data. Mm. Now if such a claim can be made, that is I have the entire model, I don't need someone else to be giving me the models, uh, giving me the data, mm. uh, then yes probably because uh, I already have my model that and is… And the model makes the decisions. Uh, model makes the decisions. Huh. But the problem is uh, many of these models need a huge amounts of data hmm. right uh, they, they can come to some level of uh, accuracy with whatever basic data sets hmm. because the uh, human insights are there there hmm. is domain experts knowledge that is being put in and so on hmm. but ideally um, machine learning uh, can make these models uh, better over, over time, time over time yeah hmm. because uh, because it can keep refining the model hmm. that we have hmm. Uh, so I wouldn't uh, quite say unless it's a very simplistic system. Uh, so machine learning is quite likely to be uh, okay, yeah, it, a part of the solution. Yeah, that's that's the reason we see that uh, there is a still so game a, theory, BDA, decision, theory, decision, decision, decision theory. Yeah, and then the machine learning. A machine learning. Uh, uh, four good areas to be familiar with. Yeah, logic, build, uh, logic based. Somebody's going to and logic based. Logic based uh, systems. systems. Uh, yeah, that's the fifth area. Yeah. Okay, we'll take a few questions. We have fifteen minutes. So, w what exactly is an agent function of AI? So, what's an agent function? What is an? What exactly is an agent function of AI? I oh, agent you. function is, uh, yeah, so that's a technical term. Uh, probably uh, this is there in our Russell and Norvig book. <laughs> so, agent function is that function that is going to decide the behavior of the agent. Huh. Right? So, typically, at least uh, in the book, the way they define it is uh, there is a table huh. for uh, capturing this agent function. Huh. And that table is going to say, if this is the scenario, this is the best action the agent should take. If this is the other scenario, then this is the best action to take and so on. Hmm. Right? So, it's... Uh, uh, as such, uh, we can say that it is a function that is going to decide how the agent should act in the different circumstances. Mm. Now, it, uh, typically it's a big table, but it need not be a big table. It can just be a mathematical function that can decide that. Huh. Huh. Yeah. So, but that's what is the definition. So, of which is the at some level that's the core of each. That's agent. the intelligence. That's the that core of each agent. Intelligence yes. in each uh, yes. agent, and then how it collectively exists also coexists. Yeah. Okay. Um, is smart grid implemented anywhere in India where consumer has the option to select the provider? I know Bombay has multiple providers and you have a choice, but I don't know if you can do it dynamically. I know you can subscribe to different providers, but I think I'm aware of only Bombay. I'm not sure anywhere else 
where yeah. there's a choice of uh, power producers. Yeah, I, I'm not uh, quite sure of actual implementations. Uh, I do know that there was someone from IBM I met uh, recently. Hmm. Uh, he was saying uh, they were trying out some smart grid implementation in one of the metros near some metro station. Now, uh, I, I don't remember any of the details. But who were the producer consumers there? Uh, yeah, I just okay. Don't, okay. <laughs> don't have to I, I know Bombay it. has it, for okay. sure. There okay. are three or four different producers. Yeah. Uh, it, and, uh, they are, obviously, only one is a state producer, others are all private. Mm. Uh, producers mm. and, uh, and and you can uh, buy from anybody okay. but I don't know if you can do it dynamically I, I think it's more like subscribing to somebody like it is uh -huh. a point in time change yeah, you so switch over from one to the other but you can't do it dynamically you can't yeah, change even it based in, on yeah even in typical smart grid probably you will have a timeline like uh, for a week or for a couple of, or two weeks you, you uh, in advance you are going to subscribe and then those huh. those timeline you probably still are with the broker but hmm. right? if you want to switch the broker probably you will incur a penalty unless the time is uh, valid unless the time is done hmm. right? because otherwise the broker will also have a problem in terms of uh, predicting their uh, workload and, their, uh, and servicing the workloads yeah yeah yeah, yeah. so, so there Therefore, there is going to be some penalty for unless you are going to follow those timelines and so on. Hmm. So it is dynamic in in the sense that those timelines can be quite small, but probably not as dynamic in the sense uh, like a stock market where we like just for instance, buy like sell. If I take as a as a net uh, meter consumer of power, I mean yeah. I I produce power and I can I can choose to give power at any given time. Mm -hmm. Now, won't it? I mean I can't. I can imagine that situation arising even now. Mm -hmm. I mean we do have load fluctuations. Yeah. Uh, and these are all at some level connected meters. Net meters, they, they, they're not, they don't use, do much other than maybe read the reading today, but they could, it can do a two-way negotiation. Yeah. What if uh, the grid were to tell me that look, right now there is a load uh, surge. Yeah. Uh, if you give me the power now, I'm going to give you 25% bonus. Yeah. So, so I can't, on the fly, if I say like, look, at this point of the day, there are things that I do, but I'm okay if I don't do. Mm -hmm. So, those things are possible today? I mean, like, uh, especially when you talk about two-top solar uh, power producers. Yeah, in the smart grid concept, it is possible. Now, but whether you are asking whether it's... Deployed, I mean, I know it's not deployed, yeah. but within the current deployment, would it be possible? Not now, in the near future. Yeah, uh, peak peak usage, that's what we call it. In fact, uh, see, uh, the Vidyut Vanika, the <coughs> agent that I mentioned, we are actually developing it on top of a platform. It's called the PowerTech platform. Hmm. And this PowerTech platform captures all of these characteristics. Hmm. And it's a platform that is in development for quite some time. So right? Who's going so, to use this now? This is being built for whom? Uh, this is primarily tailored for European markets. Okay. Yeah. So that's in fact, Indian name. PowerTech. Vidyut, Vidyut Vanika is our broker agent. So, PowerTech ah. is the platform okay, that, okay. that is modeling the entire smart grid ah. and what they are doing is every year they hold a competition. Hmm. Right? In the competition, you need to develop a broker agent who is going to learn about the behaviors of the different players hmm. and has to maximize uh, its own profit. Hmm. Right? And last year, 2018, we developed this Vidyut Vanika, ah. which was placed second in the competition. Right, mm, so nice. we developed this agent, and uh, it's an international competition, mm. and uh, we used uh, reinforcement learning along with game theory. So mm. it's a mixture, uh, it's a mixture model. So we have some amount of game theoretic elements along with reinforcement learning, mm. and uh, that agent was placed second in the competition. And but these, as, yeah, I'm sorry, and these brokers talk to each other. The in brokers, the, in the, design. Do, huh, the brokers don't talk to each other, but the brokers are going to interact with the customers. Okay. Right. Customers and the gencos. The uh. gencos are the generators of electricity. Mm. So they have to uh, look at the wholesale market and they have to say, okay, this genco provides me the tariff that is most suitable for my purposes or needs, and mm. therefore I want to buy from this genco mm. this much quantity in in this time frame, right? Because mm. we so the broker one of the big things is they have to do demand forecasting, mm. right? They have to figure out how much would be my demand in the next couple of days hmm. right and then i have to uh, buy that much of electricity because if you buy too much as i mentioned earlier uh, in the balancing market i can sell it for very low price i cannot just sell it at the same price i'm buying because that's a real time market hmm. in the real time market power is very low priced hmm. whereas buying is going to be very high priced hmm. that's how the that's the characteristic in that particular uh, simulation hmm. uh, so it also has got this uh, peak uh, 
peak usage tariff mm. right peak usage tariff means once a certain threshold is cast is crossed it actually puts a very high uh, price for the power being used mm -hmm. which means that uh, the broker agent is going to get a uh, negative penalty if uh, their usage is crossing certain limits mm. at different times so therefore through that they are going to control the behavior of the customers so the broker is going to say look uh, generally uh, for example say tuesdays on uh, 11 to 1 pm there is a peak usage of mm. electricity Hmm. So at this point of time, if a customer is going to reduce the uh, electricity usage, I am hmm. going to give them a discount. Hmm. Right? So these are all built already into this particular platform. So hmm. and it's supposed to be fairly realistic simulation of European market. So I, I don't know exactly how and the, the agent is supposed to be aware of all this. And, uh, the agent and is supposed to this. Yes, yeah. that is why it's a very complex system. Right? Hmm. So there is a lot of data here, and there is a lot of prediction that has to be done by this agent to be able to use that data. Hmm. Right? Hmm. So that makes it a very interesting, challenging system hmm. to develop. So the next question is like, uh, could you please mention references to learn the mathematical modeling of cooperative agents? Yeah, so yes, so there are a number of papers, but I would say AMAS, uh, that's the conference that uh, I would suggest to look at, Autonomous Agents and Multi-Agent Systems. It's a yearly conference and it's a top conference in uh, the multi-agents multi area. System. So you will see lots of models, cooperative models, uh, competitive models, as well as intermediate models, right? I, I mean, many times it need not be just completely cooperative, completely competitive, mm. but you have elements of both that are brought in. Right. Mm -hmm. So all these kinds of uh, systems or papers you are going to find mm -hmm. in that conference. So my suggestion is uh, you can start at that conference and once you find something more interesting probably um, uh, yeah, they can drop in a mail or uh, okay. something. Yeah, drop, that's a good offer. Yes. You can drop in a mail to Praveen. Uh, <laughs> yeah. He will respond. Yeah. Uh, can we implement CCTV surveillance uh, for remote areas uh, like say using drones and such or satellite? Um, I mean, so where I'm assuming, uh, like in this case, we're talking about drone being the uh, surveillance yeah. uh, camera on the drone. Yeah. So see, it's about price point, right? I mean, we can certainly have drones that are going all over, but they're going to consume so a lot of battery. Right, utility. Uh, so we there. we have an application for that, uh, which is uh, all these uh, crowd control. Right. So, for example, political rallies have got uh, people in lakhs or your Kumbh Mela. These are all these are places where the crowds are in lakhs of people, but they are only for certain hours or certain days. Right? So in that case, probably instead of having a fixed installation of all these CC cameras because then you have to install, do all that work, you can certainly have drones that do it. Uh, they are temporary. They just do the job. After those certain hours or days are done, you can again use the drones for something else. Mm -hmm. So probably you can build the use cases for it, but otherwise just using drones. But it also cannot be just to monitor, not just for CCTV surveillance, but it should be some decision making you should do. Uh, yes. Like maybe it's detecting a certain type of activity happening yeah. or yeah. there should be some decisioning that should be happening on the drones. Not yes. just that it's a drone to carry a camera. Yes. It so, tells you more than that. Yes, so, so, certainly. So therefore, uh, they can flag off certain behaviors, certain activities and so on. But probably at this point, uh, uh, yeah, it all depends on how the vision systems also work, which is that once they capture the video or something, whether that behavior can be flagged off or they are going to send to, send to a control room and that control room will have a couple of people that are monitoring that also anyway or at least together decide where to monitor between uh, yes. them yes that like also says i'm in this area like uh, you go to that area they yeah. somehow negotiate among themselves on where to monitor yes. at least that must be there for them to be considered a agent multi agent system. yes yes the, the sorry uh, yes so that certainly makes it a very multi agent kind of application also depending on the area coverage and all that yes. so they have to make some decision if not on what it is watching yeah. at least where it's watching between them decide yeah. which one which drone is uh, monitoring which area yes that much at least they should be able to okay yeah now um, can smart grid concept be applied to mobile broadband dth water utilities so I think I know the answer for broadband and DTH at least, because there is no producer consumer concept there. Yeah. Uh, and I can't change what I consume in a broadband. I mean, it's not altering anything, but water probably, right? I'm not a producer, huh. but I can choose when to consume. Yes. If there's a dynamic water pricing. Uh -huh. And like, can the system tells uh, that, okay, right now it is 25% penalty because of peak load. Because of peak load, uh, yes. So I can reduce my consumption at least, right? So yes. for water, it might still apply. It might apply. But not for DTH. Maybe for broadband also it could apply, but yeah. uh, where if the tariffs were to change, I can choose not to use the broadband or reduce my broadband to only critical use. Yeah, so uh, let me point out one thing. In, in the case of water, the thing is water can probably be stored. 
right which means that the same water can be valued uh, different times similarly itself the problem with power why the dynamic pricing happens is because power can't be stored or at least so not more, in efficient more critical more critical because you you have it uh, excess you either lose it or you are able to sell that's hmm. the only decision point hmm. with water probably uh, un uh, unless you don't have reservoirs in which case you just have to dispose that is different hmm. but otherwise if you are having reservoirs huh. probably it's not going to be as dynamic in pricing as power huh. probably huh. right but still you can certainly have some level of smart grid usage um, but yeah, the value is lower than power value because it can be stored so value is lower than power that's what uh, i would i would think yes ha ha now uh, are these agents monitored by humans can the behavior be tweaked i'm assuming the second part like i mean machine learning is uh, at some level a way to tweak behavior yes if a system is built to learn and adapt yes but uh, are these agents monitored by humans uh, this is with reference to the smart grid only i think i'm assuming the question is more broadly uh, okay. but could be smart grid but in general i think yeah so if it is a critical application probably we would want humans to be monitoring is my answer uh -huh. <laughs> right if it is not as critical application maybe already things are at a phase i mean see already we are having cars that are not monitored and people are willing to some extent to be be in those cars let the car take the decision uh -huh. Uh, so therefore monitoring over so monitoring is all about uh, trust i think that's how i would answer it which is that uh, the level of monitoring starts decreasing as humans trust a system more hmm. right so trust as a factor uh, once people have uh, more trust in a system then probably monitoring is going to reduce hmm. uh, if they're not uh, as trustworthy probably which is at the initial parts of the technology hmm. probably there will be a lot more monitoring hmm. that's uh, that's yeah so i think we have time for maybe one more question uh see the uh so machine learning question uh can we infer random state or size of data may increase the accuracy will the size of data increase the accuracy level of training i mean at any given time it does uh -huh. uh, machine learning more the data but it's not just a factor of size right it's also yes. quality of data quality of data whether it can bring in new features that were not present in the earlier data yeah they've right. already bringing features that's already learned then, then probably it's some level redundant data it, it is only help. going to increase the confidence in your learning probably huh. that's about it but otherwise it's not going discover to discover anything new, new that it learns yes uh, so the quality of data is more important than the uh, just the, than the quality of uh, data yeah um uh, ratio of test data and ml uh, like test data versus uh, training data yes so 20 80 30 70 these are typical numbers that uh, to be used mm. <laughs> uh, but, but again it's more at some level apportioning the data you already got right you get some data yes. you choose to say that, okay i got 10000 units of data so i'm going to keep 2000 as my test data and 8000 yes. to train yes that's so how we do 2000 i don't use to train yes i'll just use that to test but it's more the data is data yes at some level you decide yes uh, but what's a good ratio typically i think that's the question i think uh, uh, what's a good ratio of saying how much should i set aside as test data not use that to train yeah that's what 20 to 30% probably 20 to 30% is a good test data size it's a good probably. test data okay yeah. 20 to 30% yeah uh, in ml uh, sampling in state of fold uh does it help accuracy okay when sampling of data i'm, I'm assuming any data you get at some i think i think what the person is referring to is probably um uh, what what we call holding some data hold out method huh. uh what they do is uh, you understand the distribution of data uh, see for example this 20% whatever i say hmm. now i can first hold out first 20% hmm. then the next 20% then the next 20% so which means that if i take it sequentially five times i can hold out data in different forms huh. right huh. and if i am going to take it randomly there are many many combinations in which 20% can be hold out right okay. so therefore i think uh, this uh, fold uh, strata fold probably uh, is uh, how do you even if it is 20% probably um in deciding which 20% is uh, so another factor yeah people uh, people do many times over the 20, same 20% right they, they fix a number uh, but uh, they do multiple rounds of uh, model training uh, and training testing. and testing so that they want to make sure that data is all uniformly similar so reset the model each time yeah they yeah. reset and see if the model is improving uh, if the model is doing similarly okay. right otherwise what is going to happen is it means that certain parts of data are more important than others or more less important than others right so if you, if you are keep, not get ha huh. so you just keep iterating through the same data yeah take a different 20% different 20% data train with the remaining 80 yeah. see what it does and yeah. then it it brings in more confidence into your model also hmm. right which means that if there are aspects that were captured by certain specific data probably you get some indicator there hmm. and then that can add some value to your mod uh, to your model that you develop hmm. also hmm. 
So I think we have come. Uh, we've hit 6.01 already. So we just one minute past the time. So, so Praveen, thank you so much. Thank you so much. Uh, it's a very uh, engaging session. I hope all the participants yeah. uh, found it helpful as well. Yeah. So thank you. Thank you.